So um, I'm curious how uh, the arc of this season was decided upon. Was it always going to be in L.A.? Was it always going to be what it's going to be? Or were there like a few ideas that bubbled up and this was just the one you all agreed on? You know, we talked about L.A. a lot in the first season. I think because when you're talking about telling stories in the 40s and a lot of the film noir of the 40s um, takes place in L.A., um, and obviously we shoot in L.A. So it had been something that we talked about a lot. Um, and we started to build a story around that because what, what's great about that is you have the glamour and glitz of Hollywood and you have crime and corruption um, right next to each other. Um, and so we just started to, to say, well, how would we get Peggy to L.A.? Obviously is the first question. And how much time has passed between the first season and the second season? Um, and we, we wanted to see, you know, because there's been a lot of time between the first and second season and the air dates, we wanted to sort of show, okay, time has passed, people are in a little bit different positions, uh, and, you know, things have happened between these seasons that we maybe don't know about. Um, so if, and it was a very organic way to have Jarvis back, because having Jarvis in the show was super important. That was sort of the central, um, relationship with the show. Uh, and the way we did it was through Howard, because we didn't know if Dominic Cooper was going to come back. But we said, well, he works for Howard. Howard has decided to move his base of operations to LA because you have the sort of burgeoning tech field out here of Radiodyne and General Atomic and uh, JPL. So Howard's out here doing government contract work. And in his spare time, he's decided to open up a movie studio just as a hobby. Um, and so Jarvis has come out with him to set up his sort of Beverly Hills estate. So it was a really organic, fun way to explain why is Jarvis in L.A. Um, was that all of your questions? Totally. Can yeah. <laughs> you talk about some of the iconic real-life locations and the fun and, and the creative ways that you've been able to use them this season? Uh, I mean, it's actually one of the great things about shooting L.A. for L.A. is we can be wide versus it having to be an entire visual effect shot which I thought we did, I was really proud of last year in our New York um, shots, but we were limited about how often we could do it. And here, I mean, we, you know, you'll see Griffith Park, Observatory, the observatory. you'll see just, uh, I mean, some beautiful shots of driving through Los Angeles and- We shoot and the, the back lot of Universal as the back lot of Star Movie. Pictures. So you can see <laughs> yeah. like the fake, Western Street and the hills in the, the background. Yeah, it. so yeah. it's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been I think a real huge benefit to the show. I mean, there's some beautiful shots down at the LA River, and I, yeah. I mean, just really kind of iconic LA. And so that I mean, I've been. I there's nothing that a, says LA more than pulling a body out of the LA. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like that <laughs> really solidifies. <laughs> You guys talked at uh, Comic-Con about introducing uh, Dark Force into the series, and the synopsis kind of hints at that. In season one, you know, there weren't overt sort of super powery stuff going on as much. So is this season maybe opening that door a little bit more? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a crack. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, yeah. I, I, well, yeah, I mean, it's still very much our show. I mean, you're, you're definitely seeing more Marvel in this season with... Zero, we call it zero matter. Um, because the nice thing about it is they don't know what it is. It's 1947. They, they, they don't know, they, they don't call it dark force. They don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And we really do try and ground it in science because you've got Howard Stark, you've got this strategic scientific initiative. So they're trying to explain it from a scientific point of view. We actually got a physicist, a real life physicist to come in and try and give us a like so, if you if Dark Force was a real thing, how would that happen? <laughs> if you ever want to feel dumb, talk about your TV show to an actual physicist. Yes. <laughs> and get their, he was their lovely, take on and it. he, he was dumped amazing. it down for us. Yeah, no, yeah, he literally yeah. we made him draw pictures on a board so we could understand. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys always plan to include Anna in the second season, or did this come along after the fan enthusiasm? You know what? I, and it was something we went back and forth on um, in the first season of whether or not to show her. And I, when we thought, if, she, if we're moving to LA and Peggy's going to be staying with them, you cannot not show her. I mean, it, and it gave us a great opportunity to kind of, you know, who does Jarvis marry? 
and who is that person? And it was really fun to kind of develop that relationship more. I asked this question uh, of some of the cast members, but I think it's more applicable for you guys. I think the moving to LA in season two is a great switch because it adds a lot of character and flavor to the show. Um, is there talk of doing this, if you have a season three or a season four, of making this like The Wire, where every season is a little bit different, so maybe season three is London, you know, because it is a spy Not show. Not necessarily. And... Um, I think that's certainly, you, you, could, you could do that. Um, probably personal preferences, I kind of like LA. I think there's still more stories to tell, but I think we always sort of go, where, where's the story taking us? What's the best story we can tell? And then the location... Can, uh, can sort of come more organically out of that. One of the major personal storylines last season was Peggy brushing up against this sort of patriarchal ex establishment and reacting to being dismissed. How much of that remains, and, and what are the uh, new sort of challenges and struggles for Peggy in season two? Uh, I think um, Peggy has sort of gotten the respect of her colleagues, even of Thompson. Um, so... Some of that story has already been sort of resolved in that, you know, at the end of the last season, they were applauding her, so they, they, they respect her. They know what she can do, which isn't to say that everything's great in, in, in 1947, but um, uh, well, we sort of tell that story in a different way, in, a, in large part through Whitney Frost. So you've got these two smart, powerful women. The way we're designing Whitney Frost is... Um, somewhat based on uh, the real life uh, actress Hedy Lamarr, who was also sort of like the secret scientific genius. Um, and so we've sort of fashioned Whitney Frost after that. And so we have these two women who are smart and strong and ended up in very different places in their life. So a lot of what Whitney Frost goes through as an actress and as somebody who's sort of hiding her uh, genius in part because society says, well, you know, or, and, you know, no one cares about how smart you are, they care about this. Um, so I, that's sort of how we explore that. Um, but I think for Peggy's uh, sort of journey, she has a different journey than the side season. But there are still tons of creepy white dudes yeah. Oh, yeah. grasping yeah. onto power sure. as tight as they yeah, can in the sure. 40s. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Was there an intentional move to include some diversity in the cast? Like we have, we have, uh, Reggie, who brings, you know, it's mm -hmm. not all white people. No, yeah. and, and we explore that too. Yeah. And we explore the idea of, you know, as she meets Dr. Wilkes' character, and there's obviously a spark there, that that in itself has like how issue does, of that time. How does Peggy react when she sees racism. blatant racism? Mm -hmm. Spoiler, not well. Doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, um, yeah, I think that it was, um, we wanted to tell, like, have, like, a, a rich story around that um, and not feel like you're preaching about it. It's like, right. racism is not good. It's, yes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I, I really love the character of Wilkes, and I love Reggie, um, and I'm very excited for that relationship. Yeah. We haven't heard, uh, as far as we know, uh, Lindsay's not in this season, so uh, as Angie sort of discussed, uh, since that was a big friendship, obviously, in season one, we're going to not answer that <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> Is there any um, film noirs that you guys sort of referenced for the visuals for this season? I mean, it was, it was a Gloria Graham one, uh, uh, the big, big heat. heat. Big heat was big. Um, Anything with shutters. It's like yeah, like you see the you see those the Venetian blinds and just like that shot of like the light, the slats of light on somebody's face. Awesome. Um, Some Chinatown. Chinatown. We talked about L.A. Confidential, which are which are more modern noir, but mm -hmm. L.A. Confidential was it was a big touchstone for us even last season. But like yeah. in Chinatown, you know how that has a little bit of that kind of white take on a little glow. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something we've kind of co-opted into our season that I, that I really am responding to visually. Mm -hmm. um, Lady from Shanghai. Yeah. Mirrors. Mirrors become a little bit of a thing we play with. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I I mean it's such a rich kind of, I mean, genre. Right, right when we started writing this season, uh, Turner Classic Movies gave like the, I some sort of like it. class yeah. that you could watch, watch they had a film yeah. noir series and then you could take the class online. I was a very bad student and I was too busy to do it a lot too, but <laughs> I, but it was so much fun because they were, it was just, it was like a serendipity that they were showing all these movies right when we 
started to just kind of get some visual well, I read all of the James Elroy... Uh, the L.A. stuff? The new, yeah, the new book, and that. I went back and read all the... Just because it was, hear the voices in my head, it was really nice to kind of... of how he captures and L.A. The nice thing is we, we, because we knew we wanted to do this so early, we were able to sit down with our cinematographer and talk about that and say, you know, let's, we're not going to, like, copy a film noir because why, but l right. let's sort of, you know, use elements of that when it, when it works. So he was able to go and do a bunch of research and just show us, like, frames. Like, look at this amazing frame. Look at this amazing frame. And so we were able to sort of pull elements from it and... And maintain it looks our look too. Spectacular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a different show. It just feels like an evolution of the show. I think. Similarly, how do you mine all the rich comic book material that you have to choose from and zero in on things like the Dark Forest and other elements you want to use and kind of know that feels right for our show? Well, um, when we were talking about Los Angeles, we started talking about um, the city, then we started talking about the desert and what, what was going on in the desert. And there was it was all the scientific exploration that was starting to take place in Los Angeles with JPL and then just different types of testing that was going on in the desert and how like that led us to talking about Area 51 and the sci-fi of it all and the, the, the movies that were born from the 40s into the 50s and stuff like that. And so we started talking about sci-fi elements and that led us towards um, Dark Force. Can you expand on the uh, the dynamic between Daniel and Jack this season? Obviously, they both had a little bit of a promotion, but from what we've heard from the cast members, there's also still that tension between them. Well, I mean, actually, so Daniel's out here running a very green um, crew where, you know, there's still, Thompson seems to have a little bit more of a hierarchy since he's been doing it a little bit longer. Um, but I, I just think that there, they, there's a nice tension between the two of them of sort of two people who are trying to mark their territory a bit. I think they genuinely like each other. But the problem with Thompson is he's such an opportunist and he's so, um, uh, what is the word? He's so, he's so, wa yes, he so wants to succeed above all other things uh, that he sometimes makes bad choices. I think he's not a bad guy. Um, he, he just um, gets blinded by ambition. Um, and it's going to trip him up um, and put him actually at odds with Peggy and Sousa for a lot of the season. Uh, and I think there, he's going to have to make some choices where it's like, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be this person or are you actually going to be true to who you really are, which is just like, you're, you're not a bad person. Um, and so he has a really interesting arc. Following up on the question about comic book elements, when you have something like Whitney Frost, you know, those of us who read the comics are like, when's she going to put on the mask? When's she going to put on the mask? For you guys, is that kind of part of the fun of it, you know, of sort of playing with that and expectations and sort of figuring out your version of this character? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, as much as we're based on characters that come from the comic books, we're not a comic book show. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're, you know, so we have to, we always try to find our version of a character. You're not going to see her in a gold mask. You know, but it's not like you're not not going to see. Yeah, <laughs> we, we play with those concepts and sort of like how do we kind of allude to something, and and so you feel it without it being so blatant. So along that line, how does the wider Marvel Cinematic Universe affect the show? I mean, I think we always we always want to be true to it. I mean, we always want to feel like. You see us as a piece of it, but because of our time period, we kind of we we kind of are on our own I mean, a little bit. There's definitely some Easter eggs and some tie-ins yeah. uh, throughout. Certainly, the with Dark Force, it, it touches on Doctor Strange, um, and all we know is when we write something and we'll just hear. It doesn't conflict with the Doctor Strange script. We're like, score! That means we need to We had a really funny conversation today with um, Eric Carroll, who, who's uh, over at uh, Marvel Films, who's great. Because um, we were asking something for this fi season finale. It's like, can we have this thing and destroy it? And he said, well, you know, you guys are sort of the custodians of this particular character. We're like, Thanks. <laughs> uh, so Let's break it. They're, they're, like any good custodian. We are, they're very supportive. And as long as we don't um, contradict what they're doing, 
we're good. Well, we know from Marvel films, Peggy has a big destiny and she's kind of a cornerstone character in the Marvel Universe now. How does that creatively inspire you and, and are there creative limitations because we know that she has a pretty significant future? Um, not yet. I, I think it's, you know, we, we don't need much to be, to be inspired to write Peggy Carter. She's real easy to write for because we just, we love her, we love Haley. Uh, and I feel like there's a myriad of stories we can tell. And so far, it's there. There, nothing has come down that you can't tell the story about Peggy. You can't say this about Peggy. Um, so, yeah. With was, uh, characters like uh, uh, Reggie or Anna Jarvis, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Whitney Frost, um, who are both also seen in this time period as sort of outsiders, much like Peggy was in season one. How do you work to sort of distinguish their arcs so that they're not necessarily just following the same arc Peggy had in the first season of trying to find her place in this culture and sort of earn the respect of uh, the people around her? I think um, everyone, you know, to get to that place of, of getting respect, everyone has a different road to to get there. Everyone makes different choices along the way um, that define their that road. And I think with these three characters, everyone kind of has a distinct separate path. We sort of try and play, make it a virtue in that, yeah. be, that, you know, we actually really con contrast Whitney and Haley uh, in one particular episode where you sort of see how they became who they are. So uh, they, they, they all feel quite distinct, but related, I, I, and I think uh, purposefully related, I think, and Whitney and uh, Wilkes, who's Reggie, uh, actually have a, uh, an unexpected connection. Can we check for one more question? Uh, does female friendship continue to play a large role in it? Like, uh, will we see a lot of uh, time between uh, Anna and Peggy, or any other, you know? I, I mean, I think that... With Peggy, you always want to see a female friendship, but I think we explore that with Anna. We also, Rose, who is a character we established in the first season, um, she comes back and kind of... Um, Rose has a little bit bigger role this season. Uh, she's come out to, with Sousa because she was sick in New York and took up surfing. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I think we're always very careful not to have it just be a girl's don't like each other and, and, and are always thinking about who their boyfriend is. I think she, she takes <laughs> she takes uh, a lot of uh, comfort and solace in her friends. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks.